for the, org for the organizers for this opportunity to be here to interact with my colleagues and to enjoy the beautiful city. So uh, today, I'd like to um, talk to you about some work I've been doing with Martin Bendersky, Fred Korn, and unfortunately the late, the late Sam Gittler about polyhedral products. Now I understand that there are several experts in the audience and I'm just hoping that they will go to sleep uh, for the first part of my talk. So <clears throat> polyhedral products are familiar spaces from a different point of view. They are very, very simple spaces to describe. And if I make it sound complicated, then I am in error, because these are extremely simple spaces, but, they, but they're a point of view that provides insights that otherwise we would not have. So a polyhedral product is a topological space, and we like to make it with CW complexes. So the ingredients to make a polyhedral <coughs> product are a simplicial complex, which always has dimension n minus 1. And the number of vertices which the simplicial complex has is n. And that, that won't change. So I have a simplicial complex. And then I have a family of uh, CW pairs which have a base point. So here is a family of pairs, XI, AI, CW complexes with a base point. And with these two ingredients, I'm going to make a topological space. And the topological space is going to be a natural subspace of the product. So it's a subspace of a Cartesian product, a natural subspace of the Cartesian product. And that, and that space will be indexed by the simplicial complex. So right off the bat, I'll tell you that if the simplicial complex happens to be a simplex with m vertices, then the topological space will be the m-fold Cartesian product of the xi's. So the full simplex gives me the whole Cartesian product. And the simplicial complex restricts that Cartesian product to a subspace of the boundary. Okay, so I'll give you the definition, but I, I do hope you won't be distracted by the definition and think that it's somehow more complicated than I'm, than I'm saying. Um, so <clears throat> the space is defined as a co-limit of a diagram. So for us, that's just going to be a union, right? A union of spaces. Everything's finite. And it's going to be a, a union of spaces, which I call... Uh, D sigma, D of sigma, and D of sigma is going to be a Cartesian product, an m-fold Cartesian product of spaces y sub i. And the Cartesian product is indexed by the simplex sigma, which is in k. So if you give me a sigma in k, the Cartesian product I get is a product of Xi's and Ai's, where the positions in the Cartesian product are indexed by the vertices. So every time I say Cartesian product, I mean it's indexed by the vertices. And the entry will be an Xi if I happens to be in the, uh, in the simplex sigma, and Ai if I <coughs> is not in the simplex sigma. And so for each simplex, I get such a space made from Xi's and Ai's. And then the polyhedral product is the union over all simplices in K of those Cartesian products. And the union is over the obvious intersections. Now, for many important cases, these happen to be manifolds, but that's not going to concern me today. So here, let's do an example, as Sergei told us last, last time. Was it the story of Arnold who said, give me a simple, or was it Gromo, who, give me a simple example and I'll work out all the complicated ones on my own? Didn't you tell that story? I've forgotten whether it was Arnold, about Arnold. Okay, here's a simple example. 
So I take a simplicial complex, which is just two disjoint points. And so in this case, I want to take the first pair corresponding to the first vertex to be the three sphere and its boundary two sphere. And for the second vertex, I want to take the two disc and its boundary, the circle. So there are two simplices. The empty simplex corresponds to the product S2 cross S1. That will be the domain over which the union is taken. So corresponding to the simplex 1, I have the subspace of the product D3 cross D2. And it's going to be the subspace D3 cross S1. And corresponding to the second simplex, the second point, it will be the space S2 cross D2. And so I make the polyhedral product, which is the union. And the union, that is clearly, is a cross S2 cross S1. The union is the boundary of the three disk cross the two disk. Now the point here is that this is an error. To go from here to here is an error in, in this field. Um, that is a loss of information, right? The, the, the benefit of indexing everything with the simplicial complex is that, is that this contains more information than that. That's, that's the whole point. Okay, so there's a simple example. Let's do another trivial example. Uh, the same simplicial complex, two disjoint points. This time I take x and a to be c and c star. And the polyhedral product in this case is the complement of the subspace 0 in C2. Now you can realize all uh, coordinate subspace arrangements with these gadgets, but you can also realize non-coordinate subspace arrangements. Not all of them, but some non-coordinate subspace arrangements using uh, the reals. So there's another example. And so let's try to get a feel for it. So this time I want to take the simplicial complex on three vertices, which is the edge there and the disjoint vertex. And what does and I want to take when I just put one space there, I mean all the xi's are d1 and all the ai's are s0. They're all the same. And uh, in this case, the polyhedral product is going to be a subspace of the cube, which is D1 cross D1 cross D1. And it's going to be this, uh, this four-poster bed. So if you like that simplicial complex upstairs, it, it encodes this, this space down the bottom. You can see this, this, space, this space. It has lots of homotopy theory. Right. So I have gone from that simplicial complex down to a space that has lots of homotopy theory. And actually, these spaces have been studied for a long time in, in homotopy theory, but they weren't recognized in the form that I'm presenting them now. And they have lots of properties which I don't have time to go into. Now they arise. They arise in toric geometry. If I to take the xa to be d2 and s1, that's that's related to toric geometry and the topological approach to toric manifolds and so on. So they're quite important spaces. Also, uh, if I take the first entry to be a sphere and the second entry a point, they're related to quadratic algebras, to robotics. I mean, uh, uh, there are people who have, uh, in collaboration with, with Fred, who have built robots which move according to recipes encoded in these polyhedral products. Now, if, if, the, uh, poly, if the entries of the polyhedral product are a two disk and a circle, that's the, the, the toric geometry uh, case, it is called a moment angle complex. And you may have heard that phrase. And when it's D1S0, it's a real moment angle complex. And if it's a bigger disk and a biggest bounding sphere, it's called the generalized moment angle complex. And, I'm just making the point that these spaces come up all the time. And now there are a slew of papers being written about polyhedral products where the first entry is the classifying space of a discrete group and the second is point. And there are results about free groups which are obtained by a student of Fred's, who's actually coming here, a mentor stuff up, who's going to give a talk, I think, at the end of the soon. 
to do. I've never, I've not met him. I'm saying, so is he here? No, not, not here yet. But people talk about that. There are all sorts of vibrations that are due to Alex Sushu and Graham Denham that uh, give a lot of information in the case where the two spaces are uh, a classifying space and a, and a point. And they, the, 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 you can make a space here where if the first object is uh, CP infinity and the second, the A, is a point, that the cohomology of that space realizes the Stanley Reisner ring of the simplicial complex. But using these spaces, you can realize the cohomology of a large family of monomial ideal rings. So they're ubiquitous. Now, related to the polyhedral product, there is another version where the Cartesian product is replaced by the topological smash product. So that is a, the quotient of the Cartesian product. And the smash product has a rather nicer properties than the polyhedral product itself. So there is the, the polyhedral product and the smash polyhedral product where I've just replaced Cartesian product with topological smash product. If you take a space X and you take the smash product with the n-sphere, that is topologically the n-fold suspension of X. That's Okay, so why do we do that? Well, it turns out that there is a, a stable splitting after one suspension. If you take the, uh, the polyhedral product, and you suspend it once, that splits as a wedge of simpler spaces. And those spaces are smash polyhedral products. But the simplicial complex is different. It's a wedge of smash polyhedral products where these KIs range over the full subcomplexes of the simplicial complex K. So if I suspend the polyhedral product once, it splits as this wedge. Well, you know, you might look at a theorem like that and say, well, well, so what? You know, how? And there's an answer to the question, so what? And that is that in many important cases, you can recognize the right-hand side. So that gives you a handle on this uh, rather complex, simply defined, but rather complicated topological space on the left in many cases. In fact, um, a, lot, a lot has been made of this splitting theorem that uh, my, my colleagues and I proved several years ago. So that's, that's central to my talk, that, that splitting theorem. You suspend the space once and it splits apart. I mean, there are special cases uh, if K is what's called a shifted complex and, and it's been, the result has been extended beyond shifted complexes to, um, to um, um, vertex decomposable and even beyond that, uh, there is a splitting without the suspension. But in general, you do need, you do need the suspension so, uh, to, to, to get a splitting. For example, let me continue. This, this, the space S3, the Cartesian product of the sphere with itself, doesn't split unless you suspend. So there are. Uh, okay, I, I, this is not the purpose of my talk, this slide here. It's an aside. I, I want to mention it to those. It, it does have homotopy theory in this slide, but I just want to mention it because it it's related directly to the splitting. And this is work of a student of Fred's, Al Raisi. And he, he noticed something very interesting about that stable splitting of the polyhedral product. Uh, he, the automorphism group of the simplicial complex, the subgroup of the symmetric group, 
it acts on both sides of this. This, this is the, the James construction. The J is a homotopy theoretic construction called the James construction. But it's an intermediate space for what I want to say. So using this James construction, Albrecht was able to show that in cohomology, in cohomology, any cohomology theory, any homology theory, that the stable splitting was equivariant with respect to the automorphisms of K, which is a rather stunning uh, uh, result. And moreover, he was able to, uh, to um, get lots of interesting results just by considering the case where the simplicial complex was the boundary of an n-gon. And he got all these formulae which related the Euler function to the Mobius function. And it, it, it's a rather interesting result that he gets from this. By, and he gets these results by counting certain orbits in cohomology. But as I say, I just wanted to mention that because it's a particularly startling consequence of that, uh, that splitting. <coughs> okay, now I want to refine the, the splitting, if I may. Now, it's got, as I present this idea, it's going to look like it's a very special case. But it isn't, right? But it isn't, that's the point. I'm going to consider pairs which are what we call wedge decomposable. In other words, X is a wedge of, everything is pointed, X is a wedge of two topological spaces B and C, A is a wedge of two topological spaces B and E, and the inclusion of the EIs in the CI is null homotopic. And moreover, the inclusion is the identity on the BI. So a pair XA which looks like this is called wedge decomposable. Well, you can tell off the bat that this is going to be an interesting example to study because the smash product distributes over the wedge, right? The smash product distributes over the wedge, so there's going to be something you can say here. <coughs> and, and indeed there is. <clears throat> so the result is that there is a homotopy equivalence. This This here is the space in which we're interested. Remember, we only need to compute things about the z-hat because the polyhedral product, after one suspension, splits into a wedge of z-hats. So if you know the cohomology of the z-hat, you know the cohomology of the polyhedral product. Well, the theorem is that there is a homotopy equivalence from the thing that we want to this Tech calls this rub rubine red, blue and red. By the way, I apologize for the fact that my font that I've used here does not have the finesse of Vic's uh, very exquisite tech font that he was using. But I looked everywhere. I couldn't find Vic's font. Uh, so it must be a special package. But mine's rather more pedestrian. So it looks like the top is much more complicated than the bottom. You say, well, you know, what have you, gained? what have you gained by expressing this thing as something that looks much more complicated, right? That's, that's a fair question. But it only looks more complicated. It isn't more complicated. Remember, the polyhedral product starts life as a, as a union. So the key thing is that we can identify the purple, the blue, and the red. We can identify them as follows. So, to identify the purple, remember the purple is here, and the way that this differs from what I want to compute is there's no B wedge E, it's just B here. And it represents it, it represents this polyhedral product as a wedge of spaces, right? So that means that the cohomology of this piece is just the sum of the cohomologies of these pieces, and these pieces, are honest smash products, right? See, so uh, if this says, this slide here says that I know the cohomology of the purple piece, right? It's a yes. I'm, I'm just 
slightly confused. Can you tell me why the functor Z smash is not a homotopy functor? I mean, I would have thought because it's a limit of uh, a diagram space, uh, it shouldn't matter what uh, representative of the homotopy type you would put in. I mean, I oh. Uh, because you seem to make a difference. That's a, that, that's a, well, first of all, I'm assuming that the space looks like B wedge E and B and, and B wedge C, right? Yeah. So I, I haven't gotten to the case of what's homotopic to what. I'm just saying that in the special case when the X is a wedge and the A is a wedge and those wedges are related in the way that I described, then you can say what that co-limit is as a wedge of topological spaces. The co-limit is a union. Did you, oh, I thought, I thought E and C were related. They are, yes. E is null homotopic in C. But it might not be uh, null itself. No, that's correct. Yes? So, this pointed spaces, do you want them to be well pointed? Ah. Uh, do you care? I, the, 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 the base point lives in the, the spaces are all pointed, right? And the wedge point is the base point in the case of the wedge. But that is a very significant uh, a question, right? The space, yes, is the answer. Okay, well, the point of this slide, it looks very, it looks quite complicated, I know. But I, you know, slides, I wanted to rise to the occasion and give a blackboard talk but I discovered I simply don't have the energy of my, my colleagues. <laughs> I'd run out of steam if I tried to, and I would be racing. So I, because I, I don't have the, I like, I love blackboards. You know, Nigel Ray and I are in the forefront of blackboard defenders, but uh, I always seem to not be able to cover the material at a blackboard, and I, I opted to, to show slides. I recognize the danger of showing slides, but the, the point is, the point is that the purple piece was part of the decomposition, and the purple piece is a wedge of topological spaces, which I know. That, that's the point. So I know what the cohomology of the Ws is. But our goal, you might sit there thinking, well, you've got this polyhedral product that depends on the X and the A, and you would expect that its cohomology depends on the cohomology of X and the cohomology of A, right? That's, that's a fair assumption. And it does, but in a very complicated way that's indexed by the simplicial complex. And in fact, it's too complicated to get closed answers. I mean, there are spectral sequences, and you can say a lot from spectral sequence. Um, but it depends on the X and the A in a very complicated way. What this is saying is in this special case that, if I could just go back to the slide, I'm just slowing myself down, we want to know, and, and I'm asking you to take my word for the fact that this is not such a special case as you might think, <coughs> we want to know the cohomology of this, and it splits the cohomology of this plus the cohomology of this stuff. And so far, I've told you that we know the cohomology of that, right? So, so that's, that's progress if, if our goal is to work out cohomology. Okay, so that's the purple part, and it's given by that formula at the top, where these Ws here, I'm going to take E to be a point. That's all I need for this. See, the E is a point. So these W's up there are either C or B. So I'm um, into the cohomology of C and B, and that's indexed by the simplices of K. But that's just one piece. Okay, let's go on, see what else we can say. Now, one of the reasons that the original splitting, one of the cases in which the original splitting is very nice is the case where the second entry is uh, null homotopic in the first. In that case, uh, the wedge lemma allows us to describe explicitly what this smash polyhedral product is. And the D sigmas we recognize, that's just a smash product of spaces. 
And this here is, is just the link of sigma in the simplicial complex K sub i. So we, so we know that. And we can actually recognize that in a, in, a, in a nicer way than that. But the point is that the blue part is also a wedge of topological spaces, right? So if we compute cohomology, we have the cohomology of the purple. Now we have the cohomology of the blue, right? And if so, buts, right? If we know the simplicial complex, we know the cohomology of the blue right off the bat. Not a problem. And so, of course, the red is easy because the red has the B's in every entry, right? The, the A and the B are the same, so immediately we know, we know what that is. Okay, so... So the, the blue is sort of like a topological Boxster formula? Uh, yes, well, no, 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 this time it's the E is null in, it's like something comma a point. Yeah. Yeah. It's like an external scanner right Oh, it, 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 yes. Uh, well, the Hochster formula is D2S1, where the, the first thing is... Yeah, yes, okay, it is, yes. It's, it's a, a geometric realization of that. That's the whole point. So, in this seemingly special case, I've identified what the cohomology of the polyhedral <coughs> product is. That, that's the point where I am now. If you tell me what the, the spaces B, C, and E are, I can tell you, by this formula, we can tell you what the cohomology, oh sorry, I think, what the cohomology uh, of, what the cohomology of this is. So, so we know the cohomology of this, so we know the cohomology of the polyhedral product because we <coughs> have some of these things. And this is given by these three things, which, which are, I'm able to identify geometrically. Okay. So far, so good. But what can we say with that? Well, without becoming too sophisticated, we can actually say something at this point, right? Uh, there's this simple, remember, these are smash products. These are smash products made from smash products. So, the Q-fold suspension, it comes from smashing with a Q-sphere. And so it's easy to see where M is the number of uh, vertices that this formula holds if I suspend the spaces X and the space Y. Okay, well that's good to know. So that's an ingredient. And what could I conclude? Now here you are, SO3. That's a Lie group, right? Have, have, I, earned my, have I earned my keep? It's definitely a Lie group, right? Okay, SO3, let's consider the pair SO3, RP2. SO3 is homeomorphic to RP3. Now, in this case, if I suspend SO3 twice, the top cell of SO3 splits off. So that means that the two-fold suspension of RP3 is homotopy equivalent to the two-fold suspension of RP2 wedge the two-fold suspension of S3. So, if I suspend these, I get this. And you can see this is a, a B, C, B, E. E is a point. So, according to what I've done, this, this fits into what I'm saying, what's the conclusion here? Well, to get those suspensions in the polyhedral product, because everything is smashing, this is the same as that. And so the conclusion is that the polyhedral smash product is stably a wedge of smash products of the three sphere on RP2. And I just need to index them. And so I know it's cohomology. I can just work out it's cohomology. Okay, so that's one application. And the top cell splits off stably for lots of spaces, parallelizable spaces in, in particular. So this, this has application uh, right there. Now I want to, I want to, okay. Now we're the work in progress at the minute. We, we may be bypassing symmetric products, but this started just before I left, so it's not yet 
conclusive, but I feel certain that we can get around the, the argument which I'm about to describe with symmetric products. Well, why would I be wanting to introduce symmetric products, right? Why would I want to be introducing symmetric products? Well, <clears throat> I want to be able to apply this result. See, it might be that my x comma a is not a wedge. X comma a is not b wedge uh, c b wedge e. It might not be like that. But the, the spaces x and a might have that structure cohomologically, right? They might have that structure cohomologically. And I want to investigate the extent to which if the spaces X and A had that cohomological decomposition in a rather strong sense, if I can still apply these theorems. Right? So how am I going to approach that problem? Well, I'm going to uh, be drawn towards symmetric products. A symmetric product of a space X is the, the m-fold symmetric product is the m-fold Cartesian product and its quotient taken by the action of the symmetric group. And they fit inside each other using the base point. And so I can define the infinite symmetric product. And the doll tom theorem tells me that the symmetric product, wedge volume over the plane spaces, and I detect the cohomology from this space. So I want things, so I, I will have equivalences of cohomology. But I won't have maps, in, maps of spaces which induce those isomorphisms, right? I won't have maps of spaces. So I'm trying to look, make X and A look like the cohomology of B plus the cohomology of C, etc. But I won't have maps to, to use. But, and the symmetric product allows me to get around the fact that there aren't maps, right? And, and pretend. But I have to put strong restrictions. We have to put very strong restrictions on the spaces. So this is why I'm introducing the symmetric product. And the point of this slide is to say that certain maps exist on, and there's this multiplication <coughs> map that I can make on Cartesian products, which, ex okay, now, I don't really expect you to, if I was, am in the audience and I'm looking at this slide, I would say, well, how does he expect us to keep track of those indices, right? Especially after lunch. Just shuffle them around. Well, yeah, that's right. This map takes all these coordinates here and spreads them over the whole thing. Right. I, I, it's, it, it, I apologize for putting this level of, of density on, on the slide. I'm, I'm sorry, but it's, it's, it's a fairly straightforward map. And extends to symmetric products. Okay, so there is this map which goes from this product of symmetric products into this symmetric product. And notice this is Q. Now, there's a problem with that map. You can't include it into the, the Q plus first symmetric product. You've got the problem, the base point gets in your, in your way. But if you map to the smash product, it extends. So if I go from here to here, then I can extend it by adding one to all the cues. And I do get a map from the symmetric, the product of these symmetric products to the symmetric product of that smash product. That's the point of that slide. So uh, if I'm And so the, the motivation in our subject is, well, let's see what properties of Cartesian products hold for polyhedral products. And it's very surprising that many of them do. So this extends to a structure map where I've replaced the Cartesian product, which I had earlier, with polyhedral products. And not only that, I, I need another ingredient and that is if I have an isomorphism on nice, uh, the homology groups of nice spaces, then I can construct a homotopy equivalence inducing it. And it's not obvious, actually, that that can be done. 
And that's what I'm looking for. I'm trying to make up for the fact. I'm trying to make up for the fact that homology isomorphisms are not going to give me maps of spaces. Well, with all that technology in mind, uh, we arrive at this application. Uh, so you give me you give me spaces X and A. Now, clearly, we can realize the cohomology of X and A with as wedges like this by taking wedges of spheres and more spaces that pick up the cohomology. You can do that, right? There's no problem with this. By taking, by taking spheres and more spaces, I can realize the cohomology of X and the cohomology of A like this. To have the cohomology of, of a B wedge C and a B wedge E. Right? You can do that. But that's not enough, of course. Because you have to worry you have to worry about how these spaces fit into each other. So we need some strong isomorphism conditions to hold. So we know you can find a B and a C, a B and an E, so that the, the cohomology of X looks like the cohomology of B wedge C, the cohomology of A looks like the cohomology of B wedge E, and they map in in the correct way. But when we want to start working with the co-limits, we need more than that. That's not enough, what I've written here. So, <clears throat> We have to insist there's this strong isomorphism condition. So if things are free, we're okay. We're working over a field, that's okay. But we need to have not only the cohomology groups being the same and maps of cohomology groups, we need to have a map here that gives a map of long exact sequences. If that condition holds, we say that the cohomology of X and A is the, is, has wedge decomposable cohomology. If that's all true, if that's all true, <clears throat> then we, we get a theorem. So we get a, a homotopy equivalence of the <clears throat> symmetric power. So this tells me that if those conditions are satisfied, the cohomology of my smash polyhedral product looks like this, and I've already shown you why we can identify this. This splits up into pieces that we know, and once we have this, we know that the, the, the cohomology of the polyhedral product splits as the sum of the cohomology of the z-hat ki, so we know that, so we know the cohomology. Right? So that's the worth, that's the value in what I said earlier, namely that the spaces might not look wedge decomposable, but under suitable conditions, a wedge decomposable cohomology is good enough for us to be able to compute the, the cohomology of the polyhedral product, right? That's... If you try to compute cohomology, you might see, so you might not. The point is, if I were sitting in the audience now, I would be saying, What's he making such a big deal about? I mean, these are unions of spaces. I'll just throw them into my Vittori sequence and, uh, you know, turn the crank. Well, try indexing the Maya Vittori sequence, right? It's a, it's a formidable, impossible task. That's not a way to do it. You see, the, the cohomology of these spaces, just try computing the cohomology for just two points. Uh, the cohomology of these spaces is very complicated, and I just want to give you an alternative um, algebraic approach to computing the cohomology, and you'll see that it is a formidable task. So uh, any information that we can get, even under conditions of strong isomorphism, are, are, are valuable because such for such hard spaces to to compute, but as I say, the utility is rather ubiquitous and we keep learning more and more about uh, the application. So, okay, so that was a geometric approach to the cohomology of polyhedral products. So under suitable freeness conditions, if things decompose as wedges, which they do in a lot of cases, I know the cohomology. But now, I want to try a different approach, and I want to index the construction of the polyhedral product in a different way. Okay, so I'm going to, I start with a simplex with M vertices, and I want to order 
the by order the vertices, of course, and that leads to an ordering on the simplices. So, so the order of a simplex, I'm just going to call its weight. So if someone gives me a simplicial complex, and I put the simplices in order. This is the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one. Le left lexicographical order or something. Right? So now I have an order. Well, that leads to a filtration on the polyhedral product where the teeth filtration of the polyhedral product is the union of those d sigmas with a restriction on their weights, right? So it doesn't give me the whole thing. And we can see an example here. You know, I, I preach the gospel of make sure that your slides have mainly blank, blank, are mainly blank. But, you know, it's really hard to practice what you preach. Right? And I made this look more complicated than I needed to. I apologize. Well, here's an example of this filtration at work. Now, I'm trying, this is completely unrelated to what I said earlier. So now we take a simplicial complex which, which looks like this. It's just the, it's just the simplicial complex looks like this. And the vertices are called one and two. So, and I take, uh, there would have to be two pairs, x1, a1, x2, a2. And of course, k is a simplex, right? So the polyhedral product is the whole product. It's x1 cross x2, because k is a simplex, right? That's the simplex itself indexes the whole product. <laughs> Well, what is filtration zero? Filtration zero corresponds to the empty simplex. So it's just the union of D sigma where sigma is empty. So both, I pick up A1 cross A2. Then I put in my first point. I put in my first point, and that gives me this union that, well, this union that is just this, so it gives me X1 cross A2. Now I put in my second simplex, and I get this where the union is over this space here. And then finally, I put in the top simplex, the, uh, the edge, and, and that picks up the polyhedral product. So in, in this example, the filtration that I'm talking about filters this Cartesian product by these spaces. Can you back up on slide to see the sure. filtration? So I have weight. 0, 1, 2, and 3. Okay. So you're just taking the union up to the, that. So that's a filtration, right? Now, I mean, I, I show a filtration to a homotopy theorist, and, and, then, and then they get very excited, right? <coughs> but, so, uh, <coughs> The way we want to make our simplicial, our polyhedral product now is we want to start with the empty set, then we're going to add a simplex, add another simplex, add another simplex, and we're going to build up the topological space, one simplex at a time. And it's a result of Yelena and Akibich and uh, Stephen Terrio, a result of theirs, which we adapted, allows us to do this. There is a diagram of co-fibrations. Now, this is, this is very interesting. The top row, uh, the top row is the polyhedral product on the boundary of a simplex. That's a tractable object, right? And this here, this is the whole polyhedral product because it's a full simplex, and that's a cofibration which has a certain cofiber we can identify. But it's a theorem that the cofibration induced by the stages of the filtration is exactly the same, right? So if we're going to build up our polyhedral product one simplex at a time, we can identify the cofibrations that are involved, right? So you're in the best possible situation that exists, right? You've got something filtered and you can understand the filtration quotients. And there is a smash version of this. And this time, this C, this cofiber, it's just the smash product of these spaces. The quotients on, and uh, <clears throat> there is a technical point here. 
to do with ghost vertices, but that's for the experts. But for the experts in the audience, there are ghost vertices that come into this construction. And I want to make an aside here that, you see, uh, what we're thinking now is that that diagram above, where the polyhedral product is constructed inductively, that we can inductively use this to, in to show inductively that this is the same as that. Um, as long as the cohomology agrees and we have some freeness conditions, right? In other words, this diagram is likely to uh, allow us to um, obviate the need to use the symmetric product in that earlier argument. Here we're going to show that, if, that the cohomology of the polyhedral product is the cohomology of the one with the wedges inductively, right? But that argument's not a done deal yet, but I feel it will work. Okay, so we have now a polyhedral product which we have filtered, right? And if you have a topological space which you have filtered, there is a spectral sequence, right? You get an exact couple, and you get a spectral sequence, and in our case, the spectral sequence is going to converge to the cohomology of the polyhedral product. And the E1 term of the spectral sequence is readily identifiable. Uh, if I take reduced cohomology here, this half smash turns into a smash product. And so I can identify those spaces uh, in the E1 term of the spectral sequence. Now, I want to point out here that uh, Chinese mathematician, Xi Bing Zheng, he has an alternative description, an alternative spectral sequence, which is completely different from our spectral sequence. Uh, our spectral sequence, uh, we can compute his collapses, but he gets a very different answer in a very different form. But I just want to make the point that he has also uh, uh, done this calculation by different method and gets an answer which looks, well, just from the E1 term. So if we don't look at anything in our spectral sequence except the E1 term, in other words, we're not concerned with differentials, with extension problems, with anything, we look at the E1 term and we compute the Euler characteristic. Well, for the case where the simplicial complex is the boundary of a polygon, an n-gon, I beg your pardon, we compute that for D1s naught, these term, that the Euler characteristic must be this number, and so that tells us the genus of these are surfaces of, of certain genus, and we compute the genus, and uh, Alex Sushu pointed out to us that this was actually a theorem of Coxeter way back, and in fact, he had a theorem about polyhedral products. And if you look at his paper, it's, it's, it's more or less there. But in the, in the case of D1s0 and the boundary of an n-gon, the polyhedral product is a surface of that genus, if it's the n-gon. And that follows just from the E1. Another example, uh, we're working over a field here, but if if we have that these things are free, that overfield would do that. But if the x, if the cohomology of the x subjects onto the cohomology of the a, that's all you need, then you get the most general possible realization of a Stanley Reisner ring. This is a Stanley Reisner ring in a very, very general context, you see. Um, for the Stanley Reisner ring, these xi's would all be CP infinity and the A would be a point. And so you would have the a pro tensor product of the cohomology of CP infinity, that's a polynomial ring on M generators, modulo the ideal of monomials that's given by uh, mono monomials corresponding to non-spanning of a simplex. Well, it's exactly the same. I mean, here, the freeness allows us to identify the cohomology of this inside the cohomology of x, and so you get exactly the analog of the Stanley Reisner. Uh, and in fact, we can get this result integrally, because we just work over every field and the rationals. You get this result integrally, so that, that's the cohomology of that polyhedral product in this example is the analog of the Stanley Reisner even in the most general case that you can you can think of. And 
the way that the, we, the reason we can do these uh, calculations are very, it's quite a complicated spectral sequence, but it's made up of two parts. The spectral sequence is made up of two parts. One which carries no differentials, so that just survives, right? You can identify it. And the other part corresponds to the cohomology, excuse me, of a polyhedral product which we can identify by this wedge lemma, right? So with those two pieces of information, we can compute the spectral sequence over a field or when certain freeness conditions hold, we can compute the spectral sequence and say what the additive structure is. Now paradoxically, paradoxically, that stable splitting theorem with which I started and said that the suspension of the polyhedral product was a wedge of suspensions of other spaces, that's a, that's a stable theorem. But that stable theorem gives us the ring structure of the cohomology. Now that's, now, you know, in the first course in algebraic topology, you're taught that once you take the suspension, you've destroyed all product information. Not the case. Here we can reconstruct the ring structure of the cohomology from the stable splitting. And indeed, uh, we can not only get additive results, uh, we get the, the ring structure in terms of, remember I said there were two parts of the spectral sequence, well, <clears throat> the cohomology, no matter, no matter what x and a are, no matter what x and a are, in the cohomology of the polyhedral product, you're going to see this object. Now, this says D1S0, right? So how can that appear in whatever the x and a are? Whatever the x and a are, that has to be there. Well, essentially, the cohomology of that is the simplicial complex by the wedge lemma. That follows from our theorem. And so this, this here carries the information in the cohomology of the polyhedral product, which comes from the simplicial complex. right? And then that's in addition to the information of the x and the a and all the kernels and co-kernels and so on and so forth. And Lee Kai has a result where he explicitly determines the product in that cohomology of the real moment angle complex. And once you put that in, that gives a complete answer to the ring structure of, of that space. OK, that brings me to the end of the formal part of my talk. But I can't resist the opportunity to make some advertising for, for a conference. I'm spending the semester in Princeton, so I thought I'd take the opportunity and work and uh, myself, Bill Browder, Fred Cohen, and Tara Hong were organizing a conference which is in uh, commemoration of Sam and also celebrating the, uh, the birthday of Martin Bendersky. And that will be, uh, that will be March 18th, 18th to the 21st in Princeton. There is a website and I would be more than happy to um, give you any information about it that, that I can. And I want to point out that the, the proceedings of the conference, that's a little small to read, the proceedings of the conference will be included as part of a special volume of the Mexican bulletin uh, devoted to Sam. And so if you would like to submit a paper to, this, to these proceedings, we would, we would just be very thrilled. Um, the, Springer is involved in the publication of the, of the proceedings and you, you don't have to be a participant in the conference but if you would like to help remember Sam by contributing a paper or honoring Martin we would be well, particularly commemorating Sam because the, the, the volume will be devoted to that we would certainly be very thrilled to, um, to, uh, to have a submission and, and indeed to have you join us in Princeton uh, in March to attend this conference. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? <coughs> I believe Alex has a question. That's a